Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part 16 of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. I don't know how long uh, I'll be on the tube, but uh, they haven't kicked me off yet. So this is uh, part two of the book and chapter five. The title of this chapter is A Royal Remnant That Escapes. Uh, a lot of people don't know it, but uh, Daniel was the, um, he was royalty. Yeah. You know, the book of Daniel, he was, he was royalty. He was, yeah. So let's get going here. Well, good thing for the, um, the Antichrist, plural, that, um, uh, the average churchgoers will not bother reading the Bible. Or if they do, they'll, you know, read a little bit out of the New Testament, completely ignoring Genesis, which is the foundation of the entire Bible. I mean, can you imagine building a house and you don't put down a foundation and just want to throw up some a roof? with some rickety walls, I mean, it'll come crashing down. All they got to do is read the book of Acts and uh, read about the persecution of the church. Oh, well, we can't do that. So, yep, a lot of people died to give us the Bible in our own language and people are too lazy to bother to read it. And they bless those that hate and curse Jesus. So, does the Lord send them blindness? I really think so. But, hey, what do I know? I'm just, I'm just some guy who read the Bible a couple times, you know. So, uh, yeah. All right, so let's read. Uh, this is page 191 in the book, Judah's Scepter. When Nebuchadnezzar, the captain, oh, I'm sorry, when Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the Chaldean guard, gave Jeremiah privilege to go where he pleased and provided him with all that was needful for the journey the record further declares, Then went Jeremiah into Gedaliah, the son of Ahiah Hilcam, to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. And that is recorded in Jeremiah 40 and verse 6. Bob's note here. You got to realize that the uh, God allowed, God sent the Babylonians to punish Judah. And, you know, it's going to be the same thing with the U.S. and the West and Europe and the EU and the U.K. and all the rest. You know, these flood of heathens into our country is for a reason. They're going to be God's rod of correction. Very few people will believe that, but it's true. I mean, here it is, the captain of the guard of the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, told the prophet Jeremiah, you can go anywhere you want, and here's all the stuff you need. Here's some food and, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, God's hand is in this. But uh, people won't bother to read Jeremiah. They won't read Ezekiel, Isaiah, Genesis, the minor prophets that are full of prophecy. So, 
I don't know. But they'll sure open up that checkbook and send TBN a, a nice big fat check, you know, because after all, if you don't bless them, God won't bless you. You know, send them your tithe. God will give you tenfold. Yeah, right. So, hey, Benny Hinn's uh, Learjet needs, uh, you know, to be refueled, you know. And uh, aviation fuel has sure gotten more expensive, so send him that tithe. All right, the next verse of the same chapter states that the people who were still in the hand, uh, still in the land, so the people that remained in, um, uh, in Judah and Jerusalem were the poor of the land. They weren't the wealthy. They weren't the, the royal, you know. They were the farmers and what have you. And the Chaldeans allowed them to stay behind because they needed somebody to tend the fields that knew what they were doing. You know, I mean, some trees um, require little water. Others require lots of water. And, you know, you don't want to go to a different area and then kill off all the farmers like they did in Haiti uh, back during uh, when Napoleon was battling the Germans. You know, Haiti killed all the farmers. Um, yeah. And one quarter of the country died of starvation after they exterminated all the, uh, the whites from that country, which is going on in South Africa, by the way. Um, you know, a quarter of the country died of starvation, which is pretty fitting considering, you know, you kill all your farmers, right? So, yeah. So, the poor of the land of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon. So, yeah. This Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, was the man whom the king of Babylon had made governor of what little there was left in Judea, for he had taken the masses of the people into captivity to Babylon and made servants of them. It seems that since the capital city of Ju Judah was now destroyed, Gedaliah had been compelled to set up a provincial government in some other city and had chosen Mizpah. Also, when the refugees from among the Judeans who had fled into Moab, Ammon, and Edom heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judea and had set a governor over them. Then they returned and put themselves under him. Bob's note here. Moab, Ammon, and Edom were enemies of Israel, and you sure didn't want to live among your enemies. Um, like we're doing today in the U.S. and EU and U.K. Uh, so... So also did the several captains of small outlying forces until all told there was quite a goodly number in this remnant as it was called. But the little province did not prosper long for the king of Ammon entered into a plot with Ishmael. Um, Bob's note here, not the Ishmael of Abraham's time. No. Um, entered into a plot with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to assassinate its new governor, Johanan, the son of Kareah, K-A-R-E-A-H. So they discovered this plot and told Gedaliah. At the same time, he offered to slay secretly this Ishmael, the would-be assassin. But Gedaliah would not permit it. He would not believe Johanan's story and accused him of speaking falsely concerning Ishmael. However, it was only a short time and the plot was successfully carried out for Ishmael and nine of his confederates slew not only governor, but all the Chaldeans, all the men of war and all the Jews that were uh, with them. His object in all this was that he might easily make captives of the rest of the people who were unarmed and carry them away into Ammon to increase the strength, uh, to increase and strengthen the kingdom of the Ammonites. To show that this was the object, we quote the full text of the 10th verse of the 
first chapter of Jeremiah. Still, it is not of any very special interest to us to know that such was his object, but there is something in that text which is of the greatest possible interest to us. The reason for Jeremiah's going to Mizpah is there. The key to the possible fulfillment of Jehovah's promise to David is there. The possibilities of the success of Jeremiah's commission are there. The divine support to our faith and an opening door for the complete vindication of God are there. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters, and all the people that remained in Mizpah, whom Nebuzar Adon, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, and Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. What? The king's daughters? We hear you exclaim, yes, but wait until we shall gather into one focus a few other points, and then we can see the way perfectly clear for Jeremiah to finish completely his God-given task. Bob's note here. Uh, you better believe that uh, Babylonians would not have allowed Judah to have weapons. That's, you know, what, any conquering people will disarm the conquered people. Uh, think about modern day, uh, give me a G, give me a U, and then give me an N control coming out of uh, DC. Yeah, yeah, you don't want your conquered people to have access to that stuff, right? So... When Johanan and his other captains of the fighting forces heard what Ishmael had done, they gathered themselves together, started in pursuit, and overtook him at Gibeon. At this juncture, the scripture says, Now it came to pass that when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all of the captains of the forces that were with him, they were glad. So here it is, Bob's note. You know, here it is, they were taken into captivity by Ammon, those that were friendly to Ammon. And here it is, the Babylonians are coming with uh, somebody of Judah to, you know, they're going to be rescued. So, yeah, they're glad. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizbah, cast about and returned and went unto Johanan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went unto the Ammonites. That is in Jeremiah 41, 13, 14, and 15. After Johanan had retaken his captive company and Ishmael the traitor had escaped, then he became afraid of the Chaldeans and feared the king of the Chaldean empire, Nebuchadnezzar, who had placed Gedaliah over them uh, would, upon hearing what Ishmael had done, sent his army and destroy them. So under the distress and despair of the hour, Johanan, who was now their recognized leader with all the captains and the people from the least unto the greatest, made an appeal unto the prophet of God and said unto Jeremiah the prophet. So, let us beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and now pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk, and the thing that we may do. Bob's note here. Now, you got to realize something. Uh, Ishmael came and killed the Chaldeans who were guarding the area. I mean, you know, uh, soldiers. You know, if a soldier is expecting to fight, he's going to have his sword drawn and he's going to be ready to fight. But here it is. These guys came in and probably had a dagger 
and probably stabbed them in the back when they're not looking, you know, they they were accepted by the, the uh, provincial governor, you know, oh yeah, here, here's these 10, 9, 10 guys, come on in, you know, and, you know, all you got to do is go room to room and kill the people like you're friendly to them. So you can kill a much larger force that way. And they were accepted into the, the area. I mean, you know, they let them in. Here, let me open the door. Um, so, you know, you, they were invited in. So here it is. When they went to rescue the remnant that was being taken captive to the Ammonites, this guy is probably afraid thinking, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is going to think I had something to do with this. And, you know, here it is. You got his soldiers that have been killed. And I'm going to have to explain to him what happened, that these Ammonites, uh, Ishmael and the Ammonites came and killed these, your, your soldiers. Is Nebuchadnezzar going to believe him? Or are they going to be put to death? Or are they going to think I had something to do with this? So they thought about it and said, you know, maybe it's best that we disappear. You know, <laughs> this is, you know, think about it. In reply to this appeal, Jeremiah told him that he would pray for them and inquire of the Lord for them, but that they must obey. They must obey the Lord, for he would tell them just what the Lord said, whether it was for good or bad, and that he would keep nothing back. To which they replied, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God, to whom we sent, send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Then Jeremiah besought the Lord, and the Lord heard and gave instructions. Among other things, the Lord told him to say to them, Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. For I am with you to save you, and to deliver you from his hand. He also told them not, not to go down to Egypt, as was their intention, thinking they would be safe if they placed themselves under the protection of the king of Egypt. Furthermore, he told them that if they did go to Egypt, the very thing which they feared would come upon them, and they should be destroyed, saying, If ye wholly set your face to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. Bob's note here. Egypt Lord never says anything good about Egypt in Scripture. I mean, it's just full of idolatry and Satanism. And, um, you know, Egypt has, because of the Nile River, it was the breadbasket of the Middle East. They grew wheat and cotton and all kinds of things, everything that you would need. You know, if you got water, you can grow crops. But if there's a war... And your farmers are fighting in a war. Who's planting the crops? Nobody. So war almost always follows famine. I mean, I'm sorry. Famine almost always follows war. So, yeah. Just like uh, the supposed Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. I mean, it's just like uh, Nebraska and uh, what's that other Kansas, you know, that's where we grow all our wheat and corn and, you know, Kansas and Nebraska, that's, that's what they are. Uh, so if Ukraine doesn't have crops growing, there's going to be a lot of hungry people in Europe. Um, this winter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I got to admit, the uh, devil's plan is absolutely uh, brilliant. 
you know, get people away from the Lord. Don't follow what the Bible says to do. You know, do everything that the, uh, the Lord hates. So the Lord will withdraw his protection and allow the evil ones to have their way with us. Oh, yeah. All right, let's keep reading. Page 195. The Lord also told Jeremiah that the people were disassembling in their hearts when they sent him to pray for them and to make their request. So we are not surprised that it is recorded that Johanan said unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. You false prophet, you know. Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. All right, so here it is. Jeremiah has been uh, prophesying for, I don't know how long, but he warned everybody the Babylonians were coming, the people would be carried into captivity. Uh, he said, submit yourselves to the Babylonians, for, for this is from the Lord. Everything that he had prophesied had come to pass, every single thing. And here it is, he tells them, don't go to Egypt. But they got their hearts set on going to Egypt. They got their hearts set on it. So what do they do? They, uh, the devil always has his people that, you know, will tell everyone, oh, Jeremiah is a false prophet. Don't listen to him, you know? So, so, They said, Thou speakest falsely, the Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, setteth thee against us, for to deliver us into the hands of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captive into Babylon. Neither are we surprised to read the result, which is recorded as follows. But Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces, took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all the nations whither they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, even men, women, and children, and the king's daughters, and the king's daughters, the king's daughters, the king of Judah's daughters, okay? Very important. And every person that Nebuchadnezzar Adam, the captain, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakam, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah, the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah. So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus came they even to Taphanes. And that is recorded in Jeremiah 43, verses 5 through 8. But, Bob's note here. Jeremiah is not going to stay in Egypt. Uh -uh. No, he knows better. Baruch the scribe was the companion of Jeremiah in prison when the Lord took them out and hid them. He was also his companion in persecution and affliction and accusation. Now, since we find his name mentioned as one of this company which Johanan compelled to go to Egypt against the direct command of God, there is just one prophecy concerning him which we need to mention before we proceed further. It is as follows. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up even this whole land. But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey, a booty or reward in all places, whither thou goest. Jeremiah 45, uh, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. Furthermore, when that company had reached Egypt, they were at Taphanes. The Lord again used Jeremiah to prophecy concerning their destruction and also concerning the king of Babylon and his coming against Pharaoh Hophra, the king of Egypt, and many other batters. But we will only give a small portion, that which pertains to the destiny of the people whose history we are following. Bob's note here. 
You know, when your country is the breadbasket of the Middle East, you know, Babylon is like looking at Egypt going, hey, that's some great wheat growing area. And I definitely want to feed my people. So, you know, there's no revolts, right? You know, hungry people uh, are going to revolt. I mean, they're going to fight you, you know? Um, it was a Roman emperor, you know, during when Rome was an empire that said, as long as the people have bread and circuses, you know, entertainment, as long as people have bread and circuses, they'll never revolt. I mean, you know, so have your, uh, have your hot dog, your beer and your ball game and entertainment on the TV and the idiots will never revolt. Oh yeah. Yeah. So let's keep reading. All right, so, yeah, don't be surprised if there's a famine in Europe um, because of the situation in Ukraine, or at least supposed situation in Ukraine. Uh, you know, anything that's on the news, I, I don't believe anything the news says. If they tell me the sky is blue, I'm going to look outside and verify it. But uh, yeah. All right. So the prophecy opens with these words. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Judeans which dwelt in the land of Egypt. Note carefully the following. I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there. And they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword, war, and by the famine. They shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by famine. And they shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. Jeremiah 44 verse 12. By the way, people, I got an entire playlist on Jeremiah. Uh, an entire playlist. I go through the entire book of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and uh, the Minor Prophets, too. Yeah. I've been doing this for, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years. Yeah. Got a lot of material out there. Send me a USB drive. I'll send you all my work. I don't care. You know, just make sure it's a fast drive and at least uh, 64 gig. So, the complete destruction of that company is foretold in the words. Yet the Lord has in that company a few persons whose lives he has promised shall be spared. So, before the prophecy continues... Much further, this the following provision is given. None shall return, but such as shall escape. And that's in Jeremiah 44, verse 14. And before the prophecy is ended, abundant provision is made for the very few whom God has promised shall live. Bob's note here. Uh the key to the future is to look at the past. You know, the Great Tribulation is going to be like what's going on, has gone on in the past. You know, all these churchgoers think they're going to fly away in this church, the, the pre-trib rapture. They're going to end up finding out that they're going to, that they're, they're going to be called. They may be called. The, the great majority will probably be called to die for the faith. And... You know, when they when the pre-trib rapture fails to happen and they find out that their head's on the chopping block, they're going to be told, well, <laughs> deny Jesus or die for Jesus. Well, Jesus was a false prophet. He told us we wouldn't be here for this. He said the pre-trib rapture. And they'll end up denying Jesus. And Jesus said, if you deny me before men, 
Him will I deny before my Father and his angels. You know, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yeah, you don't want to hear those words. You do not want to hear those words. So, Jesus warned, we'd pro you know, there some would have to die for their faith. You know, the only, uh, the only apostle, the twelve, the only apostle that didn't die for his faith was John, uh, who wrote the book of Revelation. I mean, <laughs> ten out of the tw original twelve died for the faith. Paul, too. I, and you think, you guys think you're better than they are? Really? Really? Come on. So, all right, let's keep reading. Hence we find in the prophecy as it continues the following. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And they're talking about those that went to uh, into Egypt that wouldn't listen to Jeremiah. They ignored his warning. Don't go to Egypt. Don't do it. The Lord says, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword by the famine until there be an end to them. Yet a small number that escape the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt. Remember that the masses of the house of Judah of the uh, Judean people were in captivity in Babylon where they were to stay for 70 years years. Also remember that this remnant came into Egypt were only the ragged end of the nation, the poor of the land, and a few captains of small military forces. Now the Lord proposes to destroy this ragtag remnant out of which a small number shall escape. Now let us take our bearings. All right. One. We have in this company, which has come down into Egypt from Judea, the king's daughters, plural. Since the plural form of speech is used that there are at least two of them. History says that there were three. These are the royal seed of the house of David who are fleeing from the slayers of their father, Zedekiah, the last king of the house of Judah, and the slayers of their brothers, the sons of Zedekiah, and princes of Judah. Number two, in company with these princesses is Jeremiah, their grandfather, whom also the Lord has chosen to do the work of building and planting in the princesses. The prophet has royal material from which to build and plant. Three, in company with Jeremiah and his royal charge, we have Baruch, that his faithful scribe, whose expert, whom expert genealogists prove to have been an uncle to the royal seed. Four, God has promised that the lives of this small number, only five or six at the most, shall be to them a prey, reward, in all the lands whither they go. Five, prior to this at a time when Jeremiah was greatly troubled, when in his great distress and anguish of heart, he cried unto the Lord, saying, Remember me, visit me, and revenge me of my persecutors. Then the Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. And I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 15, 11 through 14. So what is this land that Jeremiah doesn't know? Well, can you stay with me? We're going to find out. Note the expression, thy remnant, i.e. Jeremiah's, for it is he who must build and plant the royal seed. Understand also that Jeremiah and his little remnant were well acquainted with Egypt, and since it was well known to them, it could not have been their final destination. Hence, this escaping royal remnant must journey back to Judea and then 
whither, you know, where? Into an unknown land. Why? For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they did escape out of Mount Zion, on which were the royal dwellings. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this, and the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah, the royal line, shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. This is in Isaiah 37, verses 32 and 31. That doesn't make sense. I guess it's Isaiah 37, 31 through 32, but they got it mixed up. I don't know. And by the way, G Isaiah is the most quoted book from the Old Testament in the New Testament. The New Testament quotes Isaiah more than any other single part of the Bible, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Hear it, O oh hear it, ye men of earth, hear it, shall again take root downward, be planted and bear fruit upward, he build it. Where? God should tell us where in his, wor in his word, God should tell us where in his word, and he does. That is the end of chapter 5 page 198 and we are going to do chapter 6 and my apologies everybody um like i say here it is i'm in my mid 60s um and i'm working a full-time job that is fairly demanding and uh it's not easy you know <laughs> i was hoping to retire but uh the way the prices are going who can retire so and I'm not bet I'm not asking anybody for money I know all you people are probably as poor as I am well I mean not, not really poor poor but you know I don't have a 401k with money in the bank you know which will disappear one day anyways but uh, you know I get by week to week month to month like most everybody else so you know, I'm not asking for money, and I, you know, you probably need it worse than I do. But, uh, you know, I'm just saying, I had to go back to work. You know, it's it's a shame, but uh, we don't follow God's economics laws. You know, God has laws for agriculture. God has laws for economics. He has, you know... <sighs> Uh, just judicial criminal laws but we don't follow any of them and then people wonder why the uh, their farm doesn't produce much crops why criminals walk free uh, why the money's worthless we don't have money anymore you don't no we just got pieces of paper that says dollar on them yeah I mean, you know, and a euro, a euro is not money. The Bible says that money is gold and silver. And in 1933-34, the United States made gold ownership illegal. And they took the silver out of the land, uh, coins in 65. So, yeah. And now there's printing pieces of paper that has dollar printed on it. Or dollars whatever so and don't worry it'll collapse planned of course and guess what they got a solution 666 it's coming people digital currency oh yeah we gonna do digital currency and it'll be the savior of the world create a problem and have a solution oh yeah and people think it's a joke you know, oh yeah, it's a joke. Six, 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 ha, ha, ha. You know, that Bible, it's old and old fashioned and outdated. It don't apply. You know, it was written by a bunch of people that just wanted to control the masses. Well, you know what? God, uh, Jesus said, those are mine enemies that I should not reign and rule over them. Bring them hither and slay them before me. 
Well, that's the Bob paraphrase, but you get the idea. And I hope he gives me a flaming sword and I get the help. And I hope I'm not one of the ones that are slain, but, you know. I have not been obedient like I should have been in the past, but, and even today, so. I'm just hoping I'm doing what he wants me to do, so. Yep, even Paul struggled in the flesh, so. All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Stay tuned for the next part.